Hey, what's up YouTube? Here's a quick video to very briefly demonstrate some effects that can be achieved using scene capture components and depth maps. Okay, so I have that blueprint that owns a scene capture component cube to capture the surrounding depth. Now, it's worth knowing that a scene capture component cube is actually six scene capture components stitched together. Four like that and two to cover the remaining poles and the six captures are then composited into one single texture using an equi-rectangular projection, right? So always be cautious when using scene capture component cube, well, especially if you make them capture in real time, right? There's always ways to optimize things, but out of the box they can be pretty darn expensive. I'd say at least try to limit the features being rendered, the cube map resolution as well, and use the show only actors list to only render actors that you actually do need to render and always profile and see what it's costing you and if you can afford it. Anyway, that blueprint also sends the captured location to a material collection. The capture cube depth map is then sampled in that simple material function here, using 3D coordinates derived from the direction from each pixel's world position to the captured location. It's like if the scene capture component cube captures everything around it, well, we just have to use a normalized position all around that capture location to sample the captured cube map, if that makes sense. Then here, the capture depth sampled all around that position is compared to the planar distance of each pixel to that capture position. If it's greater, then it means that this pixel shouldn't be visible from that point of view, and that's quite easily illustrated. For instance, here the capture component would capture the planar distance to that wall in that direction, right? Let's assume our shader is processing that pixel here, we derive a 3D direction from its world position, use it to sample the cube depth maps to test against its own planar distance and see that it's greater, this should be occluded. Then we use that occlusion mask to drive some color or any logic, and voila. Now, it's a bit ugly due to the very low resolution render target, but the more you increase it, the more accurate it gets. And that's really the principle behind point light shadows. Now, it's a very, very crude implementation, and you can probably improve the look of it and alienate some of those artifacts with some clever tricks. Shadows are a huge topic, right? And I didn't want to fall into yet another rabbit hole, so I kept this very simple. Anyway, I guess you could use this to create some sort of localized fog of war for your hero character or something. The second example is a bit more involved, but a bit more interesting as well. It's basically the same thing, but seen from the point of view of a camera with a given FOV. So this blueprint here no longer relies on a scene capture component cube, but on a simple scene capture component still rendering the depth, right? That blueprint now sends its forward vector and custom view projection matrix to that same material collection. Then in a material, I pass those view projection matrix X, Y, Z and W planes to a custom material function. In that function, I first get the planar distance of pixels relative to the camera's position along its forward vector. And here I build the camera UV coordinates. It works exactly the same way as that blueprint logic I shared a while ago on my Twitter and is at the core of any 3D rendering tech. It's basic 3D projection math. This gives me UV coordinates like I'd have if I were to use my screen UV coordinates and if I were to put myself at the exact same point of view, right? So I use those UV coordinates to sample the captured depth map and then compare to see if a given pixel should be occluded like I showed before. Actually, there might be simpler ways of doing this rather than having to build a custom view projection matrix in Blueprint from a given point of view and passing all four planes to a material collection, I'm not sure. Anyway, the third example is similar to the first one, but shows how you can use the exact same technique but in a post-process material to drive a custom screen space effect, nothing too crazy. The fourth and final example shows how you can pre-compute a depth cube map at a given location to drive localized occlusion effects. Like here, those particles are masked by what's visible from that initial explosion point of view, if you may, despite the effect actually being spherical, making the explosion feel like it's kinda constrained by that wall. Voila, some simple yet useful techniques to know. Files are available as a tier 1 reward on my Patreon in case you want to support me and my work. Thanks for watching, thanks for your support. I'll see you in the next video. Take care of yourself. Bye bye!